everybody, Brett Boyd here. I want to welcome you to this second part of the Gospel Goodness series on what it is to be born again and what does that picture look like. Uh, we did the first part, which covers repentance and faith and what that looks like in the light of giving your life to Jesus and surrendering your life to him. Uh, we see in the book of Acts in the New Testament, Peter's preaching and he tells the people to repent be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission, the forgiveness, the removal, and the freedom from sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so we're kind of breaking that down to hopefully help you understand salvation a little bit better, help you understand the born again life and what that means and what that looks like. So this is going to be part two. I was going to do a two-part series. First part, repentance and faith. Second part, water baptism and then the filling of the Holy Spirit. But it looks like it's not going to be um, enough time. So this is going to be part two on water baptism. And then we're going to do a part three, which is going to be on the baptism in the Holy Spirit and fire. So that'll be coming next. But I want to devote enough time to this so that you really understand and get a thorough, a thorough footing, uh, if you will. So let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name. God, I ask that you would give me all the right words, that you would help the people that are watching to thoroughly comprehend scripture and the purpose you have for our lives, God, and the fullness of understanding on what it is to be born again. God, I thank you for today and everything that you're going to bring through this video in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so let's open up the word. I want to go to a rather unusual place for this part of the series. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 1. Um, here's the thing. If we're going to talk about being born again, um, we might as well go back to the first birth, right? When God created the world. Um, so let's go to Genesis chapter 1. If you have your Bible, go ahead and open up to it. Um, I could just quote scripture, but I'd rather go there because a lot of people really want to take the time, understandably so, and see scripture after scripture. So I'm going to do that to the best of my ability. So Genesis chapter 1, okay? Because I want you to see that there are spiritual parallels to our born again new birth, um, but a lot of it is still very literal in terms of God's process and the things that he's asking us to do in order to see a change. So here we go. Genesis chapter 1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was chaos and waste. Darkness was on the surface of the deep, and the Holy Spirit, or the Spirit of God, was hovering upon the surface of the water. That scripture is really amazing when you picture um, everything that's going on in the creation of the world as we know it. Um, so, it says that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, some translations say that the earth was um, empty and void, right? And it says, darkness was on the surface of the deep, and the Holy Spirit was hovering upon the surface of the water. When you look at that word darkness in the original Hebrew, it could mean a bunch of things. Misery, death, destruction, sorrow, wickedness, ignorance, obscurity, and just nighttime, you know, a night season, so to speak. I find that very interesting that it says that darkness was on the face of the deep, comma, and the Holy Spirit was hovering. So even in the midst of our darkness, even when we're going through life without God, the Holy Spirit is always hovering, just waiting for us to call out and say, God, I give up, I give in, I give you my life. Take it and use it for your glory. God is always waiting for us to make that move. You see, it's very much like an analogy like uh, for chess, right? You move and the other person moves. You move and the other person moves. You can't go out of turn. So God sent Jesus to restore humanity. It's on us to repent, to turn to him and say, I repent. I'm turning from myself, my self-centeredness, my sin. I give you my life. Here I am. It's on us to take that next step. A lot of us are waiting for God to say something audibly or to do some 
crazy miracle to try to get our attention. And what's beautiful is he still does those things. But really, the next move is ours. If your life is without God and you're living apart from God and you don't know God, it's on you to take that step and say, God, here I am. I'm going to turn from my ways, from my selfishness, and I'm going to yield my life to you. Take my life. Here I am, Jesus. I receive you and I give you my life. So it's on us to do that, right? So here's the thing. There's there's some parallels here, but they're, they're so intertwined with what it means to be born again. Literally, a world without God is void and empty. It's a recipe for disaster, a landscape for wickedness, and a mold for misery. That's what we see when you literally look up the word for darkness, right? So, as we see then, the following verse, verse um, 3, says, Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Okay? So, it's not until God speaks that light is able to enter and truth is able to make a home, okay? So here's the thing. God is love, right? I don't think we would disagree with that. And everything that God speaks and creates comes from who he is, right? So we are created by his very word. And that's amazing to think that to a degree we literally carry the DNA of love. We carry the DNA of God. But, you see, mankind fell to sin in the Garden of Eden. And so every person that's been born since Adam and Eve is born into sin. And that's a real problem, right? And that's why Jesus came. Now, you might be saying, yeah, but babies are so innocent. I don't believe you. I, I think you're wrong, Brett. I, I think that, that everyone's born good and then life just corrupts them. Well, I actually have some pretty good evidence against that. And, and it's just to prove the point of what the gospel says, because the gospel says otherwise. It says that we're born into sin, that we're, we're born into a natural state of disaster, so to speak. And, and this is what's beautiful about why Jesus came. Right? He came to redeem us from our human nature and to give us his nature. First Peter says that, that uh, through many precious promises, we can become partakers of his divine nature. So for those of you that are saying, I think everyone's born good, and then we just go astray, and the, the world takes us in weird places. Well, take a look at like a two-year-old child. First of all, they're called the terrible twos for a reason. You don't have to train a child to learn how to manipulate, to lie, to, you know, um, to whine, to complain if he's not getting his way, because it's in our nature. We, we learn how to manipulate, how to deceive, right? Nobody has to teach us that. So where do we learn that? It's because we're born into sin and Jesus came to give us a new and living way. And so I want to touch on how baptism um, works into the picture of being born again. So here's the thing. Jesus came to make things right. I think we would agree on that. But a lot of people think that he just came to forgive us for sin. And that's true, he did. But he also came for a lot more than that. So Jesus came to, number one, forgive our sins. Two, he came to remove our sins. And three, he came to empower us to sin no more and to take up the image and likeness of God again, as we were created for in the very beginning of time. Adam and Eve were created in the image and likeness of God, but sin entered, perverted, twisted humanity and hu in, the, in the nature of man. So Jesus came to restore all things, okay? Now, in order to experience this redemption, this transformation, a few things are needed, and we have to recognize that. So the first thing is we need to recognize that apart from God, just like a world apart from God is empty and void, full of chaos and misery, that apart from God, we are empty and void. And we are seeking fulfillment in destiny, right? So many people I hear say, what's my purpose? Why am I here? You know, those kinds of questions, Jesus came to be that answer. Um, but because many people are hurt by different religious experiences growing up. Maybe, maybe they are, are forced to go to Sunday school. They're forced to um, go to church and go through all those different, um, like I think of Catholic Church, they have process for um, your first Holy Communion. And if you force somebody into those um, 
those steps, right, to try and become religious and all that, um, you can easily develop a resentment and a bitterness because it's not your own choosing. And that's why we see the importance of water baptism because it's a choice that you have to make. It's a choice of you saying, I give my life to Jesus. I, I give my life back to my Creator to do with it as He pleases. Not for the parents to dunk the child as a little baby and say, here, I'm baptizing my baby. It's, it's actually not the parent's choice. We don't see that anywhere in the Bible. There's not one baby baptism in the Bible. Again, where did we get that, right? There's a lot of things that man has incorporated to try and make things um, according to the way that seems right to man. And the Bible says that that way leads to um, really disaster. So baptism is something you have to choose, okay? Um, so we're, we're empty and void without God. We seek fulfillment usually in all the wrong places. Those of you that know my story know where that led me. Um, without God, we're self-centered, we're selfish, we're greedy, we're lustful, right? I mean, when you think about it, uh, my mentor, Dan Moeller, says this a lot, that the biggest problem in this world is not even um, politics, you know? It's not uh, racism. It's, I mean, there's so many things that corrupt this world that we say is the problem with the world. But I do agree with him that the biggest problem is that every day people wake up for themselves. It's self-centeredness. That, that is absolutely the, behind all sin, self-centeredness. You can, you can trace that to all kinds of sin. So without God, we're just living for ourselves. We're just living for the next fix, the next best thing, right? The next best pleasure, faster, quicker, uh, more comfortable way. That's what we're always looking for when, when we don't belong to God, when we don't live for Him. So first, we have to recognize that in this world, living apart from God, those things are what come natural to us. Second, we have to believe the gospel. We have to believe that Jesus came to restore us back to our original created value, our original identity as sons and daughters. Genesis 1.31 says that after God had made creation and made man, he looked back at everything he made and he said it was very good. So clearly, we were created by God to be very good. We, we have that in us, but Jesus had to redeem that because apart from God, there's no one that's good. We're not worthy on our own. We need to be brought back to God, and that's what Jesus came to do. So we have to believe that Jesus came to restore us back to that original value. We also have to believe that Jesus came, that he was crucified, and that he rose from the dead and he accomplished what he said he was going to accomplish. Then we have to turn from ourselves. We have to turn from our sin. That's part of repentance. Repent means to, to change the direction of your mind, right? We have to turn from ourself, our, our self-centeredness, our sin, right? We have to change our minds and turn toward God, surrendering all that we have and all that we are to him. It's an about change right? It's, you're going this way. You're living for yourself. Self-centeredness, right? Whatever pleases you, my way or the highway. You hear the gospel that Jesus came to actually restore us to a greater way, a way where we can surrender our lives to Jesus, get free from sin, live with purpose, live on purpose, and live to become the very love of God in this earth and help people be brought back to a place of wholeness and, and see people get saved and set free from everything that's wrong with the world. We hear that message and then we turn and we go, wow, if that's true, then I want it, God, I give you my life. That's what repentance looks like. So when you really hear the gospel preached properly, it will cause you not to just change your mind, but then change your life and turn to God and say, whatever I need to do, I'll do it. So that's, that's really that picture of repentance, okay? Now, just like when God created the world, light only came in when God spoke. So it's important to know what God says. So I want to go to Acts chapter 2. We're going to start at verse um, 38. Acts chapter 2, right? So this, this particular piece right here is after Jesus is raised from the dead. Um, the Holy Spirit is poured out. People are speaking in tongues. 
um, people are being filled with the Spirit of God, and there are, are, you know, tongues of fire on people's heads. It's crazy. But people are realizing that everything Jesus said is now coming to fruition. And Peter is preaching to the same people that killed Jesus about just who Jesus is and why they're seeing what they're seeing manifest. So it says that when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, the people that Peter is preaching to. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, fellow brethren, what shall we do? Right? They were, they were convicted in their heart. And Peter said to them, repent and let each of you be immersed or baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the removal of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. Okay? And that's the scripture I used at the beginning of this um, broadcast because it's really important that we go to God's Word and say, okay, I'm turning from myself toward God, but now what? Right? So that's why we look at that. Repent. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But we're looking at water baptism, that middle piece of that. And we don't want to get too methodical, right? Because there's always exceptions. God is God, right? We're not, but He is. So, the thief on the cross. To the best of our knowledge, he wasn't water baptized, right? He didn't go down some list of confessing sin and all this other stuff. But Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. So, we don't want to get weird with it, um, but to the best of our ability, we want to um, encourage people to go through those three things that are really, really foundational. Repentance, the turning from self and sin toward God and saying, okay, God, I'm going to give my life. And that is what baptism is symbolic of. We're going to get into that now. So, Peter lays out a real clear process of total, utter surrender to God and how God will then honor that by totally and utterly filling you with himself, okay? So, baptism, baptize, means to immerse or to saturate, okay? A lot of times we think of a baby baptism, right? Just a sprinkling on the head. That's not what they did here, though. It's not something that we should get into debating. It's just something we should do because Jesus said to do it. Now, Peter even said, every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission, the removal, or the freedom from sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I want to show you two quick places here. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 to 21. This is the Passion Translation. It says this, For during the time of Noah, God patiently waited while the ark was being prepared, but only a few were brought safely through the floodwaters, a total of eight souls. This was a prophetic picture of the baptism or the immersion that now saves you. Not a bathing of the physical body, but rather the response of a good conscience before God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is now in heaven at the place of supreme authority next to God. So it's a picture of baptism. Now, the word says, this baptism that now saves you. People get hung up on that. Even Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. So often we, we get in this way of, because of culture and because of what we're taught growing up, that salvation means I'm in and I'm not out. So I'm going to heaven, I'm saved, right? When Jesus talked about salvation and saved, there was rarely an emphasis on heaven, and this is just scriptural. Of course, there's that implication because salvation in the Greek, or saved, means to be made whole. So, of course, we're being made whole, we're being restored and redeemed back to the beginning, which means we'll, we'll never really die. We'll leave our body, but we'll be with the Lord forever. So, we have to be careful, though, because when Jesus talks about heaven, he'll say heaven, or he'll say eternal life, or everlasting life. But... The word for saved and salvation, they're very similar. In the Greek, what they mean are uh, healed, delivered, protected, our whole being prospered, being made whole. So don't get hung up on when you see the word saved and immediately think heaven, because it doesn't always necessarily mean heaven. And we got to be really careful with that. Otherwise, we get into these weird teachings, these weird doctrines, and then all of a sudden we become the judges of who's going to make it in and who's not. So let's be careful with that. But Peter said, every one of you be baptized. So clearly it's important. Jesus said, he that's 
uh, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved, or he that believes and is baptized shall be healed, delivered, protected, prospered, made whole, restored, okay? You look at Exodus chapter 14. Check this out. We see a same, uh, excuse me, we see a similar picture with Moses. Exodus 14, 13. Check this out. But this is with the Red Sea. But Moses said to the people, don't be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Here we go again with salvation. See the salvation of the Lord, which he will perform for you today. You've seen the Egyptians today, but you'll never see them again ever. The Lord will fight for you while you hold your peace. So we know how that turned out. Right, the children of Israel were were brought through the the waters became dry ground and then the waters killed the Egyptians. So again, just like Noah, the children of Israel were were in a sense saved through water. So there is a similar saving or a redeeming or restoring of things when we are baptized in water. It is not just a photo op. It is not just a chance for you to get your family in the room and take some pictures and and uh, it's not just going through the motions of your faith. There's power when you know what you're doing. You're, you're dying to yourself. You're dying to your sin. You're dying to your past and everything that you were never created for. Your fears, your guilt, your shame, your anxieties, your addictions, whatever. Let yourself be cleansed. It's a, it's a, it's a washing that brings about a new birth. You're coming up out of that water, a brand new baby. I don't want to get lost on my notes here. I want to make sure that, that I cover everything. This is so important. Matthew 28, 19. Before Jesus left the earth, he commanded the disciples to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all that I've commanded you, Jesus said. Mark 16, 16 is when Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Right now, Again, back to salvation for a second, where we see saved and salvation. It's not so much a, people are going to disagree with me, but salvation is not so much a point in time as it is a road. Because the Bible makes it clear. I can't go through it all right now, but there are so many scriptures that imply that, that we are saved and yet being saved, right? That's why we have to be so careful. There's so many doctrines out there that uh, they say, once saved, always saved. Now, are we secure in the Lord? Absolutely. But does that mean that you get saved and then you go out and you just, you live like a wreck and you you just do what you want because you're going to heaven? That's what I mean. When we let saved just mean heaven, it messes everything up. So don't let salvation just be on this day in 1976 at 4 p.m. I was saved. We need to pursue Jesus always. It's a road. It's a journey. We are saved and yet being saved. So, so don't let it just be one moment in time or it could end up growing real stale and going real bad for us. Now, just like it's not as much a point in time as it is a road, salvation is not as much about making it to heaven as, as it is about experiencing the full redemption that Jesus paid for with his blood. He paid for more than just forgiveness. He paid for the forgiveness of our sin. But he also paid for the removal of it, the washing away of who we were. And then that's where the Holy Spirit comes in, who, when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, who is a person, the Bible says, we are then empowered to live Christ-like. So, Again, water baptism is not merely symbolic, but it's powerful when you realize what you're doing. Um, everything's being washed away in that water. In fact, there's scripture that say that, that demons look for waterless places to go. You know, the early church had a, um, I'll call it a method, I guess, that right after water baptism, the people that were baptizing, and by the way, any believer is qualified to baptize another, but they would pray right after water baptism for deliverance. So whatever that person is leaving behind, excuse me, whatever life they're leaving behind, whatever their sins, the minute they come out of that water, we should be praying for people for freedom, 
that any demonic attachments that have been on that person's life, when they come out of that water, you lay your hands on them, and we should be praying for total freedom, for the Holy Spirit to come and kick out anything from the old life that's in that person. And that is then the moment when we should be praying for the Holy Spirit to come, for Jesus to baptize them in the Holy Spirit and fire, for the Holy Spirit to come and fill them with evidence of power, like we see in the Bible. So that is biblically a real clear picture, I think, of what the born-again process should look like. I also believe that, according to Scripture, that it is vital to also confess and repent prior to water baptism. I do believe that there's a, like I mentioned in the other video on repentance, that there can be a, a few different ways to repent, right? Like I live in a constant state of repentance where I'm always thinking about how I could surrender more of myself to the Lord, how I can turn more from me toward God. Um, but just deciding that you want Jesus is a form of repentance. It's a form of turning from yourself toward God. But then right before going in the waters of baptism is a good time to have a trusted person, a pastor or a fellow believer, and confess those bondages in your life. Confess those sins. Get them out and say, I am deciding, I am declaring that I give my life to the Lord Jesus and I'm dying to every old thing in this water and I'm going to come up brand new by faith in Jesus' name. Right? So that's really important. We see that John was doing that. John the Baptist was baptizing people and they were confessing their sins. Right? Um, lots of scriptures. I, I, I kind of want to run through these because it's already going on much longer than I expected. But the book of Romans, especially chapters 5, 6, 7, 8, are so powerful. You're going to want to read those in succession. Read them like a letter, not like chapters, because it was written as a letter, by the way. Romans chapter 6, verse 3 and 4 says this. Listen to this. Or do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried together with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Messiah, Jesus, was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Baptism is symbolic, but it's also very real. When you know that you're dying to who you were and you're becoming a brand new creation, there will be power in your water baptism. We see here, as it's described in Romans 6, there's a very literal power that takes place when we know what we're doing. Romans 6, verse 6 through 11 says this, Knowing our old man, our old self, was crucified with Jesus so that the sinful body might be done away with so that we no longer serve sin. Serve sin. For he who has died is set free from sin. We can be set free from sin. I hear so many Christians say, yeah, but we all have our thing. We all have our secret sins. We all have our issues, man. We don't need to make room for sin. I don't have time right now, but there are so many, there's actually not one scripture that makes an exception for continuing to live in sin as a believer in Jesus. So don't buy that lie. The Holy Spirit is the only way that we can live free from sin. No, it doesn't mean that you're exempt from uh, ever making another error, another mistake, or another sin. But it does mean that that's no longer how you're identified. God no longer identifies you by the filth, by the sin, and by the actions you've taken. He identifies you by the Spirit that's in you. And it's the Holy Spirit that brings us to our full potential as sons and daughters of God. We can't live righteous and holy on our own. That's why Jesus died, so that we would have his spirit, which is the Holy Spirit. Um, I didn't finish, sorry. Um, so now, if we have died with Jesus, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. We can live with him every day. We do, another thing, we don't just have to wait for heaven for that. We know that Christ, having been raised from the dead, no longer dies. Death no longer is master over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So also continually count yourselves both dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. 
guys, baptism can be out of darkness into light. It doesn't have to be this lifelong process where sin gradually is being broken off of your life, bondages, fears, anxieties. It can be one, two, three, if you let it be what it should be for us. Plus, biblically, everyone was baptized in water. It wasn't like some churches do it, some don't. It wasn't like once a month we gather around and we, we get a list and we, we baptize 30 people at once. When people were getting saved out on the streets, they were finding water. And I, so, I know some really awesome brothers and sisters in Christ that when they go out uh, sharing the gospel with people, they have their bathing trunks. They find hotels. They are not slow with that. They find water to baptize people because it clearly meant a lot for the gospel's sake. So why do we take it less seriously, right? Um, another one real quick, Romans 6.22. He says this, Paul says this, but now having been set free from sin, so clearly there's a before and after, now having been set free from sin and having become enslaved to God, you have your fruit resulting in holiness and the outcome is eternal life. That's amazing. But why wait for heaven to enter into eternal life when Jesus is offering it today? Um, another one real quick. 2 Corinthians. Okay, I'm not I'm not too terribly over time-wise. But we're going to wrap this up right now. Thank you for bearing with me. 2 Corinthians 5:17. Most of you guys know this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. When you're going down in that water, it's a picture of like Jesus died. We are going down in that water. And the Holy Spirit is hovering over the surface of the deep. He's hovering over that water. Right? And when we come out of that water, it's really, spiritually speaking, it's only by the power of the Holy Spirit who's hovering that is able to bring us out of that water brand new. And it's the Holy Spirit that seals that new relationship, that new life that we enter into. We're now in Christ, baby, baby in Christ, so to speak. Just like when a baby comes out of the womb, right? There's water that comes out of the womb. So just like that baby comes out of the womb, we come out of the waters of baptism. And just like a baby cries and we know that the baby's alive, same thing with us. We come out of that water and after we pray for deliverance, make sure that person's free. Uh, we pray for the filling of the Holy Spirit. That's the next video. But that's where the speaking in tongues comes. It's a new language. It's a sign that, whoa, I'm really alive. You see? Okay. Jude. There's only one uh, chapter in Jude. Jude 1, verse 24. Oh, hold on. I mixed it up. Jude 1, verse 24. Listen to this. Again, someone's not going to like this, but that's okay. It says this, Now to the one who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus the Christ, our Lord. He says, Now to the one that's able to keep us from stumbling. Some translations say from falling. The word there essentially means that he is able to keep us from sin, right? It wouldn't make sense that, that we would have a spirit of holiness and be able to live reckless. Not if it's genuinely the spirit of holiness. That's what the Holy Spirit is, guys. It's not just some religious name. The Holy Spirit. We become filled with the spirit of holiness. So that's just to, to attach on to the 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 understanding of us being able to be free from sin and then titus chapter 3 verse 4 this is referencing water baptism again but when the kindness of god our savior and his love for mankind appeared or when it was revealed not by deeds of righteousness which we had done ourselves but because of his mercy he saved us it's that same word for salvation he healed, delivered, protected, prospered, made whole. He saved us through the washing of regeneration or the, it's, it's another word kind of that could be used for baptism. 
we are, are baptized into new life in the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he abundantly poured out on us through Christ Jesus our Savior, so that being set right by his grace, we might become heirs with the confident hope of eternal life. Like I said, the early church had prayed for deliverance immediately after the water baptism. And that's really, I think, vital that we begin to do things the way the early church did because the early church operated in true power, the power of the book of Acts that we see the disciples and then the apostles operating. And so I hope that gives you a clear picture of the power that is in water baptism. It's not just symbolic. It's not just a photo op. It's when you have decided, I'm turning from who I was to who God says I am, and I'm going to die as Christ did in those waters of baptism, and I'm going to leave everything from my old life in that water. And knowing that demons look for waterless places, when I go down and I die in that water, I'm going to leave those demons there as well, and they're going to have to just suffer in the waters of baptism. And I'm going to come out, and the Holy Spirit will be there waiting to descend upon me and fill me with the very Spirit of God so that I can now live my new life in Christ empowered. The Holy Spirit is a lot more than um, what you might think. So I'm going to say that for the next video, but I hope it gives you a clear picture of water baptism. And um, it's always good to have someone take you through the repentance, the water baptism, and the filling of the Holy Spirit. Um, but And it doesn't necessarily have to be in that order. Some people actually receive the filling of the Holy Spirit before they're water baptized, and that's okay. But just know that if we want the light to come in, we need to see what God says. What is he speaking? Because when God speaks, the light comes. The truth has a home. And in the word of God, we see Peter say, how do we be saved? How, How do we get saved? Peter says this in Acts chapter 2, a little further on in the verses. He says, uh, let me just go there real quick. Acts chapter 2. I didn't finish it before. That's why That's why I missed it. But Acts chapter 2 says this. When he said, Repent, let each of you be baptized in the name of Christ Jesus for the removal of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise, this is a promise from God. This promise is for you and your children and for all who are far away, as many as the Lord our God calls to himself. With many other words, he warned them and kept urging them, saying, Save yourselves from this twisted generation. So those who received his message were baptized. In that day, about 3,000 souls were added. So it's real clear to see he's giving a picture of salvation. He's saying this is how you save yourself from the wicked ways of the world. Repent. Turn to God. Leave behind the life you were never created for. Yield your life to him and say, God, I will do what you want me to do. I will go where you want me to go as long as you are in me and that you'll never leave me. And of course, he promises that. So give your life to him today, will you? And stay tuned for the next video coming out shortly on the baptism in the Holy Ghost and fire. I love you guys. Bless you. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.